Today's scripture reading is from Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for your word this morning. And as we turn our attention to what you say, Jesus, is the greatest of all the commandments, both of them. Lord, would you ready our hearts for what you have for us today? Would you ready our hearts for what you have for us this season? We want to be actual followers of the king, not those who say we're Christian and then go live in a different way, but those who actually follow you, Lord Jesus, even through the valley of the shadow of death. And so, Jesus, would you come and have your way in us? Speak through this broken vessel that all of us would hear your word clearly, including me, and glorify your name. We ask Jesus by that name alone. Amen. You may be seated. Vote for Pedro. <laughs> Who is Pedro? Well, I'm glad you asked. Pedro is actually best friends with this guy. Who's that guy? Napoleon Dynamite. Raise your hand if you've seen Napoleon Dynamite. Come on, raise it high. Don't be bashful. All right, good. For those of you that didn't have your hand raised, ask one of the people that did have their hand raised afterward if it's worth seeing. If you like dumb humor, you will love this movie. So this is Napoleon, and this is his best friend Pedro. And Pedro is running for class president. And one of the things Pedro has to do as, class, as someone who's running for class president is he actually has to get up and give a speech. And as he begins his speech, he says, I don't have very much to say here. And then he mumbles something about wanting to bring holy statues back into the school, which was weird. But then, then he says something like this, vote for me and all your wildest dreams will come true. Vote for me and all your wildest dreams will come true. And the audience responded just like you did. Nothing. Until his best buddy Napoleon stands up because he needs to have a skit as part of his presentation. And he does one of the best dance routines you will ever see in your entire life. It's worth watching just that scene alone. You've probably seen it because it's all over the internet, but it's worth it. And because he dances this, this dance routine and blows it out of the water, even though he runs off this, the stage completely embarrassed afterward, Pedro wins. He becomes the next class president. Why are we talking about Napoleon Dynamite and Pedro? Well, in case you didn't know it, we're actually in an election season. And as part of that election season, we're hearing lots of speeches that miss the mark. Lots of speeches that, for instance, promise things that they have no ability or intention of actually fulfilling. In an election season where campaigns seek to entertain us rather than actually speaking to the issues that are before us. And as Christians, the question needs to be, what are we supposed to do about that? As Christians, how are we supposed to make sense of our world and live in a way that actually honors Jesus? This morning, we're starting a sermon series that we're calling Vote for Jesus, following our king through the muck of an election season. And that means this, simply this. We are going to look at the things that matter to Jesus and talk about why they should matter to us and then inform the way that we vote. We are going to look at the things that matter to Jesus and then discuss why they should matter to us and absolutely inform the way that we vote. Now, I said that twice because just looking out at your faces and feeling what you're, you're feeling right now, let me give you a few disclaimers as we go into this sermon series, okay? First disclaimer, we preach here about Jesus. We want you to know him, and we want to bring you into his presence, and that isn't changing. 
And so we will be talking about issues, but only ever through the lens of Jesus, his person, his heart, his mission, and why that then matters to us because we matter to him. Amen? And so if we fall short of that, we've already fallen short. So it's going to be like every other sermon series we've ever preached in this place. It's all about Jesus. Hallelujah. That isn't changing. Second, no endorsements. You're not going to show up to All Souls one day and see uh, the lawn signs with some person's name on them that we're rooting for them to win the presidency. That's not what this is about. It's not about endorsing. It's not about stumping for anyone or stomping on anyone, but it's about staying, staying focused on Jesus and calling us to a higher standard because we're His. Because we're his. We're going to unpack more of what that means as we go through this sermon and through this sermon series. Third disclaimer, a word about Christian nationalism. Right away when I gave the sermon title, some of you thought this. Why on earth are we talking about this? This means we're Christian nationalists. We shouldn't be talking about this stuff. This is not stuff we should talk about in church. Let me just push back a little bit. Friends, everything the Bible talks about is theological before it's political. Politics and politicians seize on theological issues and make them political so that we don't talk about them anymore. And if we can't talk about them here, where on earth are we going to talk about them? Everything is fair game that Scripture talks about. In fact, everything on this planet is fair game because He made it and He made us and He wants us to learn to, to live in this world together for His glory and for the sake of our neighbors, our friends, and hear this, even our enemies. And so everything is fair game when it comes to talking about stuff like this. So if you're one of those who's already drinking the Kool-Aid about, oh, Christian nationalism, we shouldn't talk about this, please let me challenge you here. That is a term that is new. It's only been around for a couple of years. And that term is incredibly pejorative. It is intended to shame us into not actually talking about the things we're going to talk about, from those on the outside at least. And so, defined from the outside, it's basically people saying it's Christians legislating their morality. It's Christians voting for Christian things and then expecting everyone to follow Christian morals and values, right? And so it's viewed as bigotry, as offensive, as you fill in all the isms there. Two problems with that. First, all laws are legislated morality. All of them. It is never a question of to whether or not we are legislating morality when we make laws. All of them are legislated morality. The only question we need to ask is, whose morality? Whose? Whose morality is going to be legislated? And if we are Christians and we believe that God made this world and made this world to function His way, and as His people, we are to be those who bless the world by living His way, then we should be voting His morality. All laws are legislated morality. Our God tells us his, and we should live like it, and part of living like it is voting like it. Second, the lie of secularism. In our culture, here's what we say. Um, we're, gonna, we're not going to make this religious. We're going to make it secular. Everything is secular. In the public square, we're secular. In the schools, we're secular. And we laud that as somehow being like non-moral, non-religious. Beloved. Religion, defined by Webster's Dictionary, is the study of man's interaction with God. When you define God as yourself, psst, there's still a God. It just happens to be you. That God is also Trinitarian. Me, myself, and I. And there are all sorts of laws that have, we have to follow as we worship the self. You know them. You see them all over social media. And there's all sorts of punishments that happen if you don't. You know them. You see them all over our culture. But here's the crazy thing. When you can define a religion as not a religion and then mandate that our schools and our government and our whole culture teach those things, guess what you've just done? You've coerced religious obedience and called it tolerance. Secularism is a religion. 
It is a religion that has a God and has ways, laws for us to obey. And to the degree that we believe the lie that, oh, we're just going to do this in a way that is not religious, we've completely misunderstood what it means to be human, always living in the shadow of the living God, friends. The lie of secularism. And so what you have here, when you, when you look at Christian nationalism as defined from the outside, is it is absolutely a trap that is meant to shame Christians into not talking about the values and morals that God says he wants us to live by and therefore vote as. So it should be, it should be called out as such. It should be resisted as such. Now, having said that, there's also a way that this idea of Christian nationalism in terms of its critique is good for us as a church from the inside. It forces us to ask this question. Where have we conflated what it means to be an American citizen with what it means to be a citizen of heaven? Where have we misunderstood that America is not the new Israel? Let me say that one more time. America is not the new Israel. The church is the new Israel. The church is the people of God. The church is the nation of God. The church is on mission for God. And our mission is about saving lost souls as Christians. That is the big picture. And that cannot be forced on anyone. That cannot be coerced on anyone. No one can be coerced into it, rather. Right? We have examples all throughout history of where theocratic states fail. Think about England before it was England. You had the Anglos and the Saxons. Ever wonder where Anglo-Saxon comes from? There it is. You're welcome. That was free this morning. Anglos and the Saxons against the Danes. When the Anglos or the Saxons were in charge, what, guess what the religion was? Roman Catholicism. And if you did not uh, convert, you died. And, but when the Danes took over, they were... The Greeks, they followed the Greek pantheon, and so they were the pagans. And so if you did not re renounce Jesus and become a pagan, you died. They forced religious belief on people. Can you ever force someone to believe something? No, absolutely cannot. And so to the degree that we down deep as Christians are believing this, man, if, if the wrong person gets in office, the world is going to end we have completely misunderstood what it means to be his. It doesn't mean there isn't blessing when we do things God's way. There is. It just means Jesus, when he comes back, didn't mention America. He doesn't promise that America as a country is going to be here when he does. It doesn't mean we're not great citizens and want to do what's best and bless our country. It does not mean that. But what it does mean is that our hope is firmly rooted first and foremost in our real home, heaven. Bless you, Timmy. So beware, America is not Israel 2.0. Beware, we are heavenites, my term. We talk about citizens of heaven, Americans, heavenites. We are heavenites, and our hope and our mission is rooted there. Did I hear an amen? It sounded like a sneeze, but I take it as an amen. <laughs> All right, fourth and final disclaimer. We are not always going to get it right. Our intention is to graciously, faithfully, lovingly challenge to walk in the truth and pursue Jesus. But there are going to be times when maybe we're not nuanced enough, times when maybe we're too aggressive in our communication, not gentle enough. And in those times, what we're going to ask you to give us is the same grace we're trying to give you. Because, see, the bait of Satan is offense. When you take offense, the other person becomes this terrible human being, right? This, this person that cannot and should not be loved because look at how terrible they are. The truth is that we just read in our text for this morning that God wants us to live by a different standard. And that's the standard of love. Love does not simply love those who love them and love them well and love them faithfully. True love actually loves even enemies so that that love becomes the place where they can turn into friends. So what does it look like for us to walk this path together? Well, I'm glad you asked because the context for our passage for this morning in Matthew 22 is very similar to our context today. Lots of political infighting, 
lots of violence going on, lots of opportunities for the religious leaders to try to do what they were doing to Jesus in our passage this morning, trying to trap him so that they could actually execute him. In fact, there's a Pharisee in our, in our text that's asking Jesus, which is the greatest commandment? And it's not because he's really interested in Jesus's answer. It's because he's looking for an opportunity to, have, to trip Jesus up. And Jesus answers with what you, what you just heard Kristen read. Love the Lord your God. We sang it this morning. With all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And then he adds something onto it. He says, realize this. All of the law and the prophets, which by the way, means their entire Bible at the time. We call it the Old Testament. They just called it the Word of God. They didn't have a New Testament at that point. It was all of their Bible is summed up in these two things. It's not just the law. It's all of it, the whole story. If you want to know the whole story, here it is. Love him with all you've got. And because you're loved by him, go out and share that love with everyone you can. Share it with. That's the whole story. We could end the sermon right now. We won't, but we could. Notice what Jesus doesn't do in our passage for this morning. He doesn't give fear a foothold. He doesn't do what the the culture around him is doing, and that is trusting in the the love of power, right? We want to trick you. We want to to get you in a place where you're in a place of weakness, and we can control you, and we can eliminate you. Jesus could have done that easily. Remember in the garden when he says, don't you know who I am? I could just call down 12 legions of angels and wipe everyone off of this planet. But that's not why I'm here. It's not about the power. It's about, or the love of power. It's about the power of love, which is what Jesus is actually displaying in our passage for this morning. When someone who's coming absolutely deceptively, trying to trick him, Jesus gives a real answer that challenges this man and all of us. I want to tell you what it's really like so that you can actually change because that's why I've truly come that you could have this life and have it to the fullest. Love him, it's why you were made. Love one another, it's why everyone else was made. The power of love. In our culture, it's not what we see. We see the exact opposite of that, where it's, it's commonplace to just lie, to deceive, to say the exact opposite of what you know to be true one day, and then to say the opposite the next day, and to somehow think that that's okay. To be deceptive, to be manipulative, to lie, to murder in our hearts one another, and sometimes even with our hands. In our culture, that's become commonplace, expected even. A sense of like, hey, that's going to be okay. Trump and his voters, they're all racist, heartless, and, and they're all bigots. That's the message that's out there. It's so extreme. All of Trump's followers are racist, heartless bigots. All of Harris's followers and, and Harris herself, sexist, woke lemmings. You could put other words in there. But is that really true? Is that actually what's going on? Do, are, the, are we so far from one another on these extremes? Is that person evil? Or is there maybe something more going on here? For instance, perhaps some deception. Perhaps there's been some pain that's brought this person to this place. Perhaps there's a bigger story than you know. See, it's one thing when you're talking about ideas. It's quite another when you're talking about real people. God has called us to a higher standard, friends. That standard is love. This is how we know what love is, the Apostle John writes, who, by the way, calls himself the one that Jesus loved. Doesn't even use his name. I'm the one that Jesus loved. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Laying down your life for one another is not trench warfare. It is not using our social media platforms to destroy the other side. It is not talking to people as if they are ideas that can be dismissed and canceled. It is about truly entering in And we're going to unpack what that looks like in just a second. It starts by us remembering who we are. 
Remember who God called us, who we were when God called us. Consider Jesus' motley crew of disciples. Just look at this list. You have Simon the Zealot, right? He's the guy who's uber right wing. He's the the one who wants to go in and destroy Rome and and raise up the army, and they're going to win, and Jesus is going to be that kind of king. Wrong, but that's who he is. Then you have Matthew the tax collector on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. He's the guy who's embraced Rome. We said, this is pretty good. We can make lots of money. Who cares if we sell out our God and our people? Let's go. Complete opposites, and they're on the same team. Not to mention you have Mary the prostitute who has several demons cast out of her when Jesus enters into her life because she's been so deep into that darkness. And then, by the way, all of them are racist. Those are the 12 disciples. Just let that sink in for a second. They're Jesus' A-team. And they're going to have to go through a lot of fire before they're ready. But friends, what I want you to see is Jesus doesn't say, hey, who's already like me? They're my team because I feel comfortable with them. He says, God, who needs to be on my team? You send them and then I'll love them. Do me a favor. Really quickly, just look around the room. I'm I'm looking at you, I'll wait. Look around the room. Look at one another. Look at one another. These are the people that God has sent. This is his A-team. We didn't choose one another. He chose us. And his expectation is that we are going to love one another. (laughs) Hallelujah. Paul says it like this, consider who you were when you were called. And he basically says at the end, we were all fools, less than, had nothing, and yet Jesus saw us, chose us, came and got us, and brought us home. It's like we talked about last week with the parable of the prodigal son. If we don't start there, friends, if we don't start at a place of our desperation, then we start to act as if our lack of deception is because we're smarter than everyone else or more holy than everyone else or more moral than everyone else when the reality is the only reason why you see clearly is because of the grace of God in your life. And the only reason why you're willing to look at what you see and wonder if you're actually seeing clearly is because of that very same grace in your life. Who do you want to be? No, better question. Who are you in Jesus? Who are you? Who did he die to make you? And are you living like it right now? You see, Jesus doesn't say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself as something that he didn't already do. He's our savior, which means he's done it all for us. He's fulfilled the law. He loved his father with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then who was his neighbor that he loved? Do you remember when he's nailed to the tree, what Jesus says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Let me rephrase that. Father, forgive them because they are deceived. You know the number one definition of being deceived? is you don't realize it. You're tricked. You're duped. And you don't know it. And so some of you right here are wondering, who's he talking to? Who's deceived here? I wonder. And some of you are pointing at Liam. I saw you were pointing at John or, you know, to your neighbors, right? Like you're pointing out other people in the room that might be deceived. You're like, clearly Pastor Will is deceived because look what he just talked about, right? Like, And the whole time, the one person you're not asking the question about is yourself. The whole thing about deception is you don't know. And so rather than just pushing past that, can we all start in the same place in this season as the one place on the the face of the planet that is designed by God to have Republicans and Democrats together in love? 
because we have always been more than Republican or Democrat or Independent. We've always been more than that in Christ. We are family first. And so what about starting with yourself? What about each of us starting with ourselves? Where, Lord, have I been deceived? Where have I not loved my neighbor as I would want to be loved by my neighbor? Because I've already written them off as an idea rather than a person to be loved. Beloveds, this season is going to get darker and darker. What are we called again? The light of the world, a city on a hill that the world can see lives life differently. There's peace there. There's security there. There's love there. There's safety there. There's knowing and being known there. Where? Here the family of God, doing life differently because we know where we started from. But don't forget what Paul writes to that same church in Corinth. Such were some of you. As you consider who you were before Jesus came into your life, realize that's not who you are anymore. Hallelujah. We have been set free to live life differently because of what Jesus has done. The real question is going to be, are you willing to apply that grace to the places where you have given your right, yourself the right to hide? The pain you've pushed down, the offense you've taken, the, the sense of injustice that you just can't swallow, where they are in your gut, are you willing to say, Jesus, in all of these places, I give you permission? Because to the degree that we have secret sin, friends, secret sin that comes out like our social media pages or the gossip we have with the people that think like us already about other people who don't think like us already, the secret sin that comes out all the time, so in other words, psst, one more clue, it's not secret. Everyone sees it. That sin that everyone sees, including God, it's an opportunity for you to confess your sin and learn again freshly that he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us and give us the spirit of unity that we, we might be bonded together in the bond of peace. This is what it means to be his beloved, to do life differently, to love as our neighbor Jesus has loved us. Well, how do we do that? Well, we've been unpacking the first point already, believe it or not. And so we're almost done with the sermon for those of you who are asleep. It says, love Yahweh your God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Why? Because when we start off here, Romans 5, 8, God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When that's our starting point, that we did not get justice. Please hear this. We did not get justice. What we got was grace, undeserved merit. When we start there, it changes the way that we interact with those who treat us unjustly. When we have been given such grace, it allows us to share that same grace with others. Let me share, you, share a story along these lines and then another one after this. I wasn't sure I was gonna share this this morning, but okay, Lord. My Aunt Dottie died on Thursday. She was one of the brightest lights in our world. She and my Uncle Eddie got married at 17 and 18 years old. Married for 65 years, I think, something like that. Crazy. Their entire adult lives, she served. She was a nurse. She played piano in her church, loved the Lord with all of her heart, and continued to give all of her heart to him, even to the place where, as the generation above her started to get sick, she would bring them into her home and nurse them to heaven. She was the hospice care for our family, always with a smile. But what strikes me about my Aunt Dottie is not just the glory that came out of her, 
but the glory that came out of her towards particular people, like my grandmother, her mother-in-law, who was not very nice to her. Mother-in-laws can be that way, not my mother-in-law. She's the best. <laughs> but mother-in-laws can be like that, right? But my nana, is what we called her, she was t a tough cookie and really tough on my Aunt Dottie. And my Aunt Dottie took care of her for months and months and months at the end of her life, never once complaining. She took care of her own father, who was ornery and mean to her for months and months and months and loved him to the very end. She lived this, friends. She gave up her adult years, the years where she should be retired and off traveling and doing awesome things, seeing the world because she worked her whole life as a nurse. She gave all of it back to invest in two particular people who, please hear this, apart from their time with my Aunt Dottie, I don't believe they go to heaven. But because of their time with my Aunt Dottie, they got to see and know the love of Jesus that they had been rejecting their whole lives. Beloved, what does it look like to love even those who so regularly sin against us that we've confused them as our enemies? And what they are is broken, hurting, deceived, just like you. How do we love our neighbor as we would want to be loved? We must first remain rooted in the love we have received, the grace we have received from Abba Father, Jesus' Son, and our Holy Spirit. Second, we must try our luck. Listen, understand, and care. Luck. We must try our luck. Meaning this, in relationship with people that we already know are different, it feels weird, right? We're like, I don't know if this is gonna work. Try your luck. How? Start listening, step one. Start listening, not listening so that you can formulate a response that then counteracts their point, wrong. Start listening so that you can understand why they think the way that they think and feel the way that they feel. And I guarantee you what you will find is pain, loss, trauma. Dig down a little bit, earn the right to hear their story and you will figure out, you will find them as real people why they think the way that they think, even if they're wrong. And you know what'll start happening? You'll start actually caring for them and less about the issue. But you know what might also start happening? You might get a much more nuanced view of what that issue actually is and how to know Jesus in the middle of it. Try your luck, love them, like you would want to be loved. Listen, understand, and care. A an example of this that we've talked about here before that I just want to bring to your attention again is this real-life story. This is a movie called The Best of Enemies, and it's based on a book um, that change is worth fighting for. No, no, that's not the book. It's based on a different book, um, but this, The Best of Enemies, is the true story of desegregation in North Carolina, in Raleigh, North Carolina, in the 70s. And here it is in a nutshell. The white school and the black school. The black school ha ha catches fire and starts to, is, is no longer livable, and they're trying to get the black students into the white school. But you know who's standing in the way? The KKK. And the white people who are a part of that way of thinking. They're in the way. And so the local government brings together this committee that's full of black people and white people, and two of them, Ann Atwater, who's a civil rights advocate, and C.P. Ellis, who happens to be the KKK president. He's the leader of that local chapter. And they are arch enemies. They hate one another. 
They want nothing to do with one another. They want, like C.P. Ellis, had, there's nothing you can tell him that's going to change his mind. He doesn't want black people, black students in the school with the white students. Not with his kids, not ever. You know what changes everything for C.P.? Ann Atwater starts to listen and begins to understand that C.P. is deceived. And he's deceived because of past trauma in his life and in the life of those who lived before him. But he's also hurting because he has a son with special needs that's in a mental hospital but isn't getting the care that he needs because C.P. Ellis can't afford it. Because Anne started to listen and understand, she started to care. And in caring, she went and found her friend who happened to be a nurse and an administrator in that hospital and got CP's son transferred to a different room where he could be safe and he can continue his stay there without the trauma that he was experiencing. When CP Ellis learned what Ann Atwater did to him, it broke him in half. No longer could he see her as simply an idea or an animal. He saw her as a human being, as a Christian, as someone who was giving him grace, loving him in ways he did not deserve, but understanding his pain, entering in, and paying the price to address it. She tried her luck, in other words, and her luck came through. She listened, understood, and care, cared. And the power of that love changed C.P. Ellis so that when they took the vote, guess whose vote broke the tie? C.P. Ellis. And guess when he stood up in front of the crowd, the entire town was there. He stood up to cast his vote. He took out his KKK membership, ripped it up in front of everyone and said, I'm done. And then from that point forward, they traveled around the country telling their story of racial reconciliation. If you think that there is more to love in power itself rather than the power of love on display for all to see, you're still not listening. The power of love changes everything and everyone. It costs, yes, but it's worth the investment because it changes our world to be what it was always intended to be, heaven on earth, enemies becoming friends, and not just friends, but family. This is what we're talking about. This kind of knowing and understanding and listening to one another as we walk through this season that isn't anywhere close to this. We don't live in segregated, the segregated South. We don't have the KKK around us. But you know what we do have? The same sort of stuff. Racism, trauma, brokenness, pain, fear, all the stuff that was at work underneath it, still present. And in this place, the family of God, we get to do this differently. It's worth the investment. It's worth leaning in. I love looking out on a Sunday morning and seeing a foretaste of heaven in front of me. We're different on every level. That makes us stronger. That makes us more whole. That makes us more like Jesus. Because the last I checked, he doesn't want us all to be thumbs or big toes or knees. We're part of his body. We're meant to be different on purpose. And sometimes those differences are designed to actually help each other grow as we speak the truth and love to one another and grow up into Christ who is our head. So here's our challenge for this morning. As we think about this standard of love, this higher standard, two things. Where is God calling me into deeper intimacy with him so that he can heal and strengthen my heart for the season ahead? I'll rephrase that. Where is he calling you to love him with all of your heart, not most of it? All of your soul, all of your strength, all of your might. Deepening your intimacy with him because from that place, you can bear the storms. You can make it through. We can make it through. Where is he calling you deeper? Where are those hidden places, those secret sins we talked about? 
that he wants you to let go of? Where's the place of control that you're like, nope, for these reasons, I'm not going to, wherever that is, he's not going to force your hand. But he's also not going to bring you to the next level until you open your hand. Number two, whom do I need to pursue in order to listen, understand, and truly care for him or her? Some of you already have people in your, your mind and in your heart. People you've seen on Facebook or some other social media platform. People that you know in your life you've been called to love, but they think very differently than you. This next season, can I challenge us as a church to buy lots of coffee? What do I mean by that? Get together with people who are different than you simply to understand them so that you can listen, understand, and actually care. I guarantee you, friends, if you go into that with an open heart that's looking to actually learn and love, you will find yourself loved, encouraged, and actually you will grow. If you try to pursue something like that with the aim of changing someone else's mind and you, you reveal all of the deep stuff that you haven't dealt with yet, it won't work out so well. Step one comes first. Have that conversation with the Lord. Then step two, ask him. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then love your neighbor as you would want your neighbor to love you. It's always been clear and simple, but it will cost you everything. It will cost us everything to follow him like this. If you're willing, friends, what we're gonna see in the season ahead is glory, glory. We're gonna see glory because we're gonna see Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, we don't want to just talk about these areas, these questions. We want to actually ask you. So right now, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would reveal to each of us in this room and those online, where are the places, Lord, where we have yet to experience intimacy with you because of our own sin, because of our bitterness, because of the lies we've believed, because of the trauma that we've experienced? Where are those places where we have resisted you and you keep knocking. Would you bring them to mind right now, Lord? Jesus, I pray that as you do bring them to mind, that Lord, we, our hearts, which are already warmed by your presence and your love, would, would find themselves encouraged, Lord, to look in a different kind of way. To not hear the voice of shame because that's not your voice and we bind the voice of shame in Jesus' name. I tell you to stop talking. Instead, Holy Spirit, we pray that as you bring conviction, you would also bring invitation that comes with comfort, that comes with wholeness, that comes with promise. If you confess your sins, I am faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. Lord, make us a people of deep intimacy with you, we pray. And Lord, as you do that, would you also then show us the people that you've called us to love like we've been loved, to love our neighbors as ourselves. Who are those folks who think differently than I do, who believe differently than I do, who it's too easy to write off because they're an idea and not a person? I pray that this would be a season for our church, Lord Jesus, where we interact with one another like family, like real people who have real stories that we truly and deeply need to know. Help us to listen well, to understand, and to actually care. Jesus, we give this election to you. Thank you that you are in control. Thank you that no matter what happens, you are king, and that our hope and our security is in heaven with you. And that, Lord Jesus, you, your kingdom, as it has already broken in, will bring to completion the work that you've begun. And so, Jesus, we ask for the nations, not for the sake of America, no. For the sake of King Jesus, we ask for the nations 
We ask, Lord Jesus, that, Lord, many would come to know you in this season ahead. We trust you no matter who is leading in this country. We ask for your blessing, for your guidance, for your favor in all of these things, even as we lay them down and surrender again. In Jesus' name, amen.